Um, we're going to cover Chapter 8 today, Linear Programming Applications. It builds off Chapter 7, which was an introduction to linear programming. And uh, we're going to basically talk about the different kinds of models that you, you'll see and some tips and tricks on how to model something that's a little bit more complicated. So we'll probably go through these seven applications uh, in a little bit and um, talk about it. So the graphical method that we used in the last uh, chapter was good for understanding and getting introduced to linear programs and then transitioning from looking at the graphic graphical method to using Solver or QM, which is basically just a, 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 an overlay of Solver. But um, you're never going to solve two-dimensional, uh, two-variable linear programs. Uh, linear programs that are of any interest and of any value in business have several variables, uh, maybe hundreds of them. And we're going to look at problems that have more than two, definitely, but probably not more than 15 or 20. Uh, at the max. So that's what we're going to look at here and see how that works. Um, first thing we're going to do is look at a marketing application. Uh, so, you know, how do you m use your media uh, in advertising and marketing to um, get the right kinds of uh, results? Uh, maximum results for your marketing and advertising campaigns. You want to either have a fixed budget, a budget limitation, where and then you want to reach the maximum number of people for that budget. So that would be a maximization problem. Or you would want, on the other hand, have a uh, minimization problem where you want to reach at least a fixed amount of people but you want to minimize the cost. So they're kind of dual problems of each other. In this case, we're going to look at maximize audience exposure and minimize advertising costs. Uh, so this is the Win Big Gambling Club. Promotes gambling junkets to the Bahamas, has 8,000 per week to spend on advertising. So there's a limit on advertising and we want to reach the most number of people for that. So there's different media types and again, this book is old, so we have, you know, radio spots and TV spots, and newspaper ads, and probably billboards. Uh, no more than 18. So media types and audience figures are shown in the following table. It needs to place at least five radio spots per week. No more than $1,800 can be spent on radio advertising. So here's a TV spot. Audience that can reach per ad is a one-minute TV spot, five thousand costs eight hundred, and the maximum ads per week is twelve. Daily newspaper full-page ad is uh, reaches eighty-five hundred people, and the ad costs nine hundred and twenty-five dollars, and you have to have less than or equal to five of those. Radio spots uh, there's two types: thirty-second radio spots and one-minute radio spots. Uh, the thirty-second ones are in prime time, and they reach. Uh, respectively 2400 2800 costs 290 to 380 dollars and uh, there's a maximum on those two of 25 and 20. so as you begin to assign, assign the variables to this and again i'm against uh, especially if you're going to do it in solver i'm against using x1 through x4 call them what they do i mean x1 should be tv um, x2 could be np for newspaper uh, X3 could be R30 for 30-second radio, and um, X4 could be, uh, I don't know, what would X4 be? Yeah, one minute, so 60 minutes, R60. So you want to maximize the coverage. So here's, if you look here, this is the number of people each ad read. So this is the number of ads you're going to run. So this is the number of people you're going to get. We want to maximize that. Can't have more than 12 TV spots, no more than five newspaper, no more than uh, 30 or 25, 30 second radio, 
and I think this is supposed to be no more than 20. They have newspaper, but I do believe it's supposed to be uh, one minute radio spots ads per week and then here's your budget it costs you 800 925 per the table and that has to be less than 8,000 um, x3 plus x4 you can't you have to have at least five radio ads and the max dollars to spend on radio no more than 1800 so I have to have at least five ads and I have to have um, I can't spend more than 1800 of my 5000 on radio so if we put it in solver all of a sudden this is what we're going to start to see you're going to see a lot of open space and you're going to see a lot of these kinds of patterns of ones and zeros and then you're going to have some of these where there's numbers, but the bigger the number of variables you get, the more sparse the constraints tend to be. And they went and solved it and found out that, again, we don't need all these decimal places, but that's okay. Um, you're going to reach an audience of 67,240, and you're going to basically have... Um, two TV ads, five newspaper ads, six 30-second radios, no one-minute radio ads. And then you've used up all your radio, and you still have some surplus in radio spots. Uh, I mean, you haven't gotten down to the minimum. And let's see, what are the binding constraints? This is binding, and that's the only one. That one, that one, and that one. So you have some room if you can expand your budget to use more TV or use more of these. You could change this radio and maybe reach more people. But I think they put the limits on the radio ads. Why? They wanted to probably not reach the same audience all the time. So marketing research. Um, this can also be used to um, do some consumer research. So if you're doing polls, you can use... Uh, linear program to make your strategy decisions. This is a little bit more complicated. It's taking up a complication level. So this uh, firm is doing a study. They have to survey at least 2,300 U.S. households. Survey at least 1,000 households whose heads are 30 years of age or younger. Survey at least 600 households whose heads are between 31 and 50 ensure that at least 15% of those surveyed live in a state that borders on Mexico, ensure that no one, that no more than 20% of those surveyed are 51 years of age or over and uh, live in a border, a state that borders Mexico. Wow, this is getting quite complicated. But you can see if you're doing like a presidential uh, polling or something like that, you're going to have all these kinds of constraints that you're trying to test for and find out how you're doing in this demographic and that and you'd probably want to represent uh, the population and you'd have to have these kinds of constraints so what is it we're trying to do we're probably trying to um, the survey should be done in person it estimates the cost for reaching people and the following are as follows so states bordering mexico at age under 30, age 31 to 50, age over 51. Here's the cost of reaching those people in states bordering Mexico, states not bordering Mexico. You have this. So we're probably going to try to minimize the cost and reach a certain amount of people. So the goal is uh, to meet the sampling requirements at the least possible cost. So we're trying to minimize costs. X1, the number of people... A, uh, 30 or younger uh, number of uh, in a border state and this is the other thing that happens you think you might have these th age groups and you might have bordering or not bordering Mexico they live in a state that borders or not borders Mexico what happens here is how many variables do you have well if you have these two dimensions multiply you have three age groups and two state classifications you're gonna have six variables so you have to have 30 or younger in a border state, not in a border state. 
31 through 50 in a border state, not in a border state. 51 years old, uh, 51 or older in a border state and not in a border state. So you have these variables. Again, I'm not sure if you want to call them X1 through X6. You could call them 30 border, 30 NB. You could call it 31, uh, 3150 B, 3150 NB. At least it would kind of tell you what it is. Uh, so here we want to minimize the total costs, interview costs. So here's my cost of interview. Here's my six variables. Boom. I got it all laid out. Now I want to get at least 2,300 people. And it says here X1 and X4 has to be greater than 1,000. Households 30 or younger, I have to have at least 1,000. Households 31 through 50, I have to have at least 600. Now here's one, X1, X2, X3. That's the border states have to be only 15% of the total. And here's the other one, limits on the age group 51 that can live in a border state. So here's the one that live in a border state. It has to be less than 20% of all of that age group. Now, these last two are confusing. These are percentage kinds of um, constraints. You've got variables on both sides. Notice up till now, we've only had the variables on the left-hand side and the variables on the right-hand side. These are not valid constraints as written. So let's explore looking at, at, at this one here, the, the limit on the age group. So here's the constraint. It's not a valid constraint. All the variables have to be on the left-hand side of the inequality. The right-hand side needs to be a constant, like basically a fixed number. Algebra is involved to make this constraint valid. So we start with this. We subtract this from both sides. So it's 0 0.2, not 0.20. It's equivalent. It's the same thing. 20% is 0.2. Subtract that from both sides. So I get x1 minus 0.2x3. Plus, uh, plus x6. Now the distributive law applies. Remember the negative distributes as well as the 0.2. x3 minus 0.2x3 minus 0.2x6 has to be less than or equal to 0. Simplify this. So I get 0.8x3 minus 0.2x6 has to be less than or equal to 0. Now it's a valid constraint that can be coded into solver. You have to do the same for the uh, previous constraint, too, for this constraint. It's a little bit harder. And the way this comes out is going to be um, 0.85 this, 0.85, 0.85. And then for the next four, it's going to be minus 0.15, minus 0.15, minus 0.15. Let's see if that's accurate, if we've actually done that properly. And that's what it comes out. Here's our 0.8 and our minus 0.2 for the constraint that we actually looked at. And here's my 0.85s and minus 0.185s. Now they've put the zeros in here, but if you got rid of the zeros, it'd be a lot of blank space. And you could reach 15,000, it's going to cost you $15,000. You're going to reach exactly 2,300. That's a binding constraint. This one's a binding constraint. This is binding constraint. You've got some surplus here, and this one is also a binding constraint. So you don't have a lot of room to wiggle here on this problem. So here's uh, the following table summarizes the results. It will cost them $15,000, and here's the kind of people they're going to reach. So notice that they have two zeros, so you might not want that. You might want some representation in each of those, but the way they structured the problem, you get zeros there. So that might be an oversight. You might have to go back and modify your constraints to make sure you get at least a certain amount in these, and that will change your number, probably make your costs go up a little bit. Now, the kind of problems we've looked at so far are all production mix problems in Chapter 7. And we're going to make that a little bit more complicated because we don't just make tables of chairs. We don't just make fans and air conditioners. We make lots of things. Or we make two products, but we complicate the heck out of it. We take into account inventory and all of that. So we're trying to find out the optimal mix of products to produce to either minimize costs or maximize revenue or sales. So this is a company that makes ties. Produces four varieties of ties. One is an expensive all silk, one is all polyester, 
and then they have two are polyester and cotton blends. And here's, oops, sorry. Um, the material is silk, polyester, cotton. Cost per yard, they have it here. So you see silk is more, most expensive. And materials available for the month in yards. And it's a spe specified width. So we're only looking at uh, maybe it's square yards or whatever. But you have 1,200 yards of silk, 3,000 yards of polyester, and uh, 1,600 yards of cotton. Firm has contracts with several major department stores to supply ties. Contracts require minimum number of ties, but may be increased if demand increases. Their goal is to maximize monthly profit given the following decision tables. So X1 is the number of all silk ties to produce per month, number of all polyester ties, number of blend one polyester, number of blend two cotton ties. So here's their kind of data table, all silk. Selling price is 19. 8.7, uh, $9.52, $10.62. Monthly contract minimum, they have to have 5,000 silk ties, 10,000 all polyester, 13,000 blend one poly cotton, and 5,000 of the blend two silk cotton. I think that's also poly cotton, but that's all right. That's the contract minimum, and the monthly demand is this. So you might not hit the demand, but you've got certainly, certainly got to hit the contract minimum. Materials required per tie, boom, right there. And it's 100% silk, 100% polyester, 50-50 uh, polyester cotton, and then it's 60 silk, 40 cotton in this one. So you got the selling price. You've got the materials per yard. If we go back a couple slides, you got the uh, cost per yard and we're trying to maximize profit and we don't have profit anywhere so this is another thing that happens in a linear program a complicated linear program you may have to do some calculations before you even begin to model it as a linear programming problem so here's you've got to calculate now the profit here's my selling price Here's the materials of each kind that are required. Here's the cost per yard of that material. And this is the number of yards of material required. You multiply these two together to get the cost per tie. You take the difference of the price that you sell it at minus the cost, and you get the profit per tie. So notice that you may have to do some calculations that have nothing to do with linear programming to set up the problem. So if you set this all up, here's my profit per tie. Uh, and it tells me subject to, I've got my yards of silk, yards of polyester, yards of cotton. And I look at my all silk ties and I look at my blend four. It has to be less than 1,200. I can't use more than I have. Uh, my polyester, the all polyester tie and the polyester blend. And then the cotton and the poly cotton blend and the silk cotton blend has to be that and then here's my contract minimums but then I have a contract max so you'll see this x1 has to be less than 5,000 x1 or greater than 5,000 and less than 5,000 you want to say I have to x1 has to be between 5,000 and 7,000 but that's not a valid constraint you can't have two inequalities in a constraint, so you have to separate it into two. Constraint one, bigger than the minimum. Constraint two, less than the minimum. So just bear that in mind as you model some of this stuff. And as you put it in a solver format, again, notice the patterns. You have zeros and ones. You have a lot of this kind of cascading uh, pattern happening. And they're going to try to make, they're going to make four hundred twelve thousand dollars. It sounds actually sounds realistic. Um, and here's um, the number of ties of each type they're going to make. No, that's the profit. Sorry. Here's the the number of ties they're going to make of each kind. Okay. Profit per tie, and here's the number of ties you're going to make. So that's a total profit. And let's see, because this is a binding constraint at the um, 
But this one is not binding, not binding. So you can go through and look at it. The more of you have it, you're not going to go through constraint by constraint and see what's binding. That's why you have the answer report that just does that for you. Okay, production scheduling is the next thing. Um, it's a man another manufacturing operation, and let's look at this problem. It's Greenberg Motors, manufactures two different electric motors for sale under contract to some other company. Uh, Drexel places orders three times a year for four months at a time. Demand varies month to month as shown. So here's the, the two motors, the uh, Greenberg uh, Motors. Uh, 3A and 3B, and here's uh, the numbers for each of those. Wants to develop its production plans for the next four months. So, desirability of producing the num same number of motors each month. I mean, every manufacturing person wants to have a level production so that you can keep your costs down uh, in terms of overtime and labor and blah, 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 and just manufacturing people just love to produce the same number if they could. They only want to produce one product if they could. Uh, but you have to look at keeping inventory costs down. You can't over exceed the limits of your warehouse. And uh, they have a no layoff policy, so you want to keep your workforce stable. So linear programs are a useful tool for doing this. So AI, the number of model GM3A motors to produce in month I, 1, 2, 3, 4, January through April. Number of model GM3B motors to be produced in the same month. So we got eight variables right there. It costs $20 to produce GMA3, 3A, and 15 to produce GM3B. Both costs increased 10% on March 1. So we're going, we have two months, January and February, uh, at, at this cost, but then 10% more after that. So it's 20, 20, 22, 22, plus 15, 15, 16, 50, 16, 50. <clears throat> Again, another little dose of realism there. Now here, we want to start including inventory They'll probably put some limits on inventory, but I can't. I have to create what they call a dummy variable. It's not part of the objective function, but it's a variable that I'm going to calculate and use. So we can use the same approach to create the proportion of objective function dealing with inventory carrying costs. Because we haven't done inventory carrying costs yet. Uh, inventory of A1. Units of GM3A left in inventory at the end of month I. I for 1, 2, 3, 4. Same thing for B. The carrying cost for the first motor is 36 cents per unit per month, and the next one is 26 uh, cents per unit per month. I mean, the motors have to pay their rent in the warehouse, right? If they're just sitting there, they have to pay the rent. They're, they're using this space. So the carrying cost, cost of carrying inventory is this. Notice the prices didn't go up. So now we combine these two for the objective function. And now we have how many? We have eight. We have 16 variables already. End of the month inventory is calculated using this relationship. Inventory at the end of the previous month plus current month production uh, minus inventory at the end of this month equals sales. So we know what the sales are going to be because they've given us their demand. So we really want to do this. We take the inventory at the beginning of the month, current month's production, minus the sales, and that will equal the inventory left at the end of the month. So you have this kind of, the January demand for both motors, zero coming in, plus the sales minus 800, zero, uh, you came in with a zero balance, blah, blah, blah. Rewritten as January constraints, A1, minus the inventory is the balance inventory. B1 minus the inventory there is uh, that balance. It's kind of complicated. So now we complicate it for the rest of the months, and it looks like this. I'm not going to explain it over. You can look at it more. But I have my A2 sales minus my previous month's last inventory, and that has and that's going to be equal to 700, which is going to be uh, the February demand. And the constraints for April's ending inventory are these, because you want to end at the end of each 
uh, a four-month period with a zero inventory. We also need constraints for warehouse space. So this tells you in, in month one, two, three, four, we only have 3,300 spaces in the warehouse for these two motors. No worker is ever laid off. So as a base employment of 2,200, 2,240 labor hours per month, by adding temporary workers, available labor hours can be increased to 2,560 per month. Each GM3 motor requires 1.3 labor of hours, and each GM3B requires 0.9. This is a complicated problem. So here's my labor constraints. Whoa. What if I model this whole thing? Look at this monstrosity. You have 15 variables, or you have 16 variables. You have your demand constraints. You have your labor constraints. You have your storage constraints. And notice the patterns. A lot of zeros, a lot of ones, and a lot of, like, you know, this cascading kind of thing. This would be as hard as a problem as I would ever assign you for the last thing. And if you've been assigned a problem like that, um, take it as a compliment. I'm challenging you. I'm trying to, I think you've got something in you that needs to struggle and be tested. Uh, that's what we do. So here's, um, there's production schedule and here's the cost. So you, you can look at this in Solver and you get the costs. Here's this and here's the production schedules and all the stuff that's here. But you really want to put the answers together somewhat like this. Summarize it. Managers don't want to look at this. Your executive team doesn't want to look at this. They want to look at this. So you've got to formulate it nicely. That's the purpose of having a report in this last assignment too. Uh, let's look at labor planning. These problems address staffing needs over a particular time. They're especially useful when there is, it's, it's almost like a production scheduling, but it's a staffing scheduling instead. So this bank has requirements for between 10 and 18 tellers, depending on the time of day. Lunchtime from noon to two is generally the busiest. Banks employ 12 full-time tellers, but has many part-time workers available. Part-time workers must work exactly four hours per day. And they can start anytime between nine AM and 1 and are inexpensive. Full-time workers work from 9 to 3 and have a one-hour lunch, which I think you can schedule at various times. So here's the time frame and the number of tellers you need. So we only have uh, 12 full-time tellers and you see that most of the time there's only one hour where we actually need or two hours where we need 12 or less. Three hours, sorry, I can't Pay attention. Part-time tellers are limited to a maximum of 50% of the day's total requirements. Part-timers earn $8 an hour. Full-timers earn $100 per day on average. The bank wants a schedule that will minimize total personnel costs. It will release one or more of its part-time tellers if it's profitable to do so. Notice, $8 per hour, $100 per day. Be careful. You, these things have to all be probably per hour. It's real world, you get numbers different ways, but it's also professorial curveballs thrown at you. So here's the number of full-time tellers. And then you have part-time tellers starting at 9, 10, 11, noon, and 1. If you just said the number of full-time tellers, the number of part-time tellers, you'll have a hard time modeling this problem. That's why I always suggest that you leave, put your pencil down and try to think, how many variables do I really need and what am I trying to do? Most uh, people, when they do linear programming, uh, think they need less variables than they really do. You've got to add, like in that last Greenberg uh, Motors problem, who would have thought we would have needed uh, 16 variables? Um, four each for the production of motors in each month, and, but also the inventory tally variables. And that the inventory was dependent on the production and the demand and all that, but you've People tend to think we need less variables than we really need. So if you model this now, well, here you go. And again, you can see the zeros and a lot of zeros, a lot of ones, and this cascading pattern is, that always seem to happen. And remember, you can't model it this way in Solver. You're going to have to use the distributed laws, 32P1, 32P2, etc. 
Remember, they work for four hours, so they've, they've upped it to a day. Remember I said you have hours and days? Either make them all hours or all days. Uh, obviously, they're smarter than me and made them all days, but they can't work more than four hours. So at eight hours and it's a four-hour shift, it's that much. So if you have full-time workers all the time, and 50% of your four, you're going to take half your full-time people at lunch at 11 to noon, and half your uh, other, the remaining half of your full-time people take the um, noon to one lunch hour. And you go through and model this, and then you put it in solver, and it gives you the answer like this. Here's the solver solution. Again, you can see zeros and ones, cascading pattern. I'm probably overemphasizing that. And then you have some financial applications as well. Uh, you invest some money. Uh, and we had a couple of those problems in, um, I'm probably signed for this week. <clears throat> terrorist team. So you have trade credits, corporate bonds, gold stocks, construction loans, interest earned, maximum investment. In other words, you you to try to you don't want to put here. If you're a risk taker, you're gonna put all your money in gold stock because that gives you the most return. But you want to balance your portfolio, and this is the way they've done it. So you want to probably maximize your return on investment for a fixed investment amount. Is probably what they're trying to do. So they have five million dollars to invest, maximize the return on investment for the next six months, satisfy the diversification requirements set by the board. What are the diversification requirements? This right there is a diversification requirements. The board also decided that at least 55% of the funds must be invested in gold stocks and construction loans, and no less than 15% can be invested in trade credit. So you got these percentage things again. Remember, when you set it up first, you're going to have variables on both sides of the inequality. You have to do that subtraction like we looked earlier and do that. So here's the dollars invested in each kind of stock. That's, and your objective function is the return on that. So that's a six-month return. Subject to, I can't put more than a million dollars in uh in the first one, 22.5 million, etc. And then I have my percentage constraints. Remember, I got to subtract this stuff from both sides and simplify. I got to subtract this from both sides and simplify. And then guess what? I don't have to invest all my $5,000, but I can't invest more than that because that's all I have. So there you go. You have four variables and you have four, five, six, seven constraints. Remember you always have to have the non-negative constraint in there. So if you solve this, you're going to find out you're going to make $712,000. And um, here's the investments that you're going to make. And here it is in solver again. You see zeros and ones and the cascading thing that I always talk about. Truck loading problem. Well, you know, they have way stations everywhere because they don't want trucks to be overloaded. And trucking companies would love to overload the trucks, but the added weight puts wear and tear on the roads and requires road construction sooner than states and municipalities want to do that. So this shipping company has to ship the following items. Here's the value of the good. Here's the weight of the goods in pounds. The objective is to maximize the value of items loaded into the truck. The truck has a capacity of 10,000 pounds. The decision variable is proportion of each item loaded on the truck. So we're only loading one truck, and here's the stuff. I assume they all have to go to one location, or maybe it's one route. So you want to maximize the load, the value, the load value. So here's how many proportion of each item is loaded on the truck. So it's a percentage we're actually doing. So be very careful when you define the variables too. And then you subject to the weight capacity. So now the percentage 
of the total weight of that value. So this is 25, 22,500 in value, and it weighs 7,500 pounds. So if I load half of that, it's going to be 0.5 times this and 0.5 times that. And I want to get a $10,000 capacity. And each of these, since it's, it's got to be, they're all going to be greater than zero, but they all have to be less than or equal to one. So it becomes a number between zero and one, which makes it a proportion. And now you're going to just take the most. So if you want to maximize your value, you look at maybe your things, you know, the, it's, it's a combination of value versus weight. The things that have the most value also have the most weight. The things that have the least of uh, value have the least weight. So how does this work out? You put it again in a linear program, <laughs> zeros, ones, the cascading ones here, uh, and you have a total value of 31,500. You load 7,500 pounds, or 70, you, you use the entire value of, of these two, because they're the most valuable things, and then you fill the rest with, uh, with these other products. All right, and you've still hit your weight limit. You've right up to your weight limit. Everything seems to be a binding constraint except uh, these. So you basically load a third of your first product, all of your second product, and then none of your others. Well, this might not be realistic because they might need some of those. But that's the way they structured this problem. What if item one, you know, here's some what if problems. And I might ask you some what if problems on your uh, team project for, for this week seven and chapter eight. Uh, you'll give me the solution. I'll say, well, the solution calls for one third of item one to be loaded on a truck. What if I can't divide it into smaller pieces? What if I insist that there's a minimum requirements of each product that must be shipped? Uh, all of that stuff could happen. So using integer programming, which is the solution uh, required to only contain integers. We're not covering that to load one unit uh, of items three, four, and six for a value of twenty-seven hundred thousand dollars, two hundred fifty. I will ask you. I'll ask you to solve the base problem, and then I may ask you a follow-up question. And I expect you to do that and use that in your report, because you got to anticipate what the next question is going to be asked. Here's another diet problem. All right, it's animal feed or human meals. Uh, animals get feed, humans get meals. But we look at uh, three bulk grains to blend as a natural cereal. And we're looking at protein, riboflavin, phosphorus, and magnesium. And we want to blend this, these three, three grains into a natural cereal that will yield some basic requirements. So. Uh, pounds of grain A, pounds of grain B, pounds of grain C in one two ounce serving of cereal. So we're really going to have small number of pounds. This, it can't be, if you use all A, it's only going to be two ounces. So here's the cost per pound. The amount of riboflavin in pound, per pound. Uh, protein per pound, I'm sorry. Riboflavin per pound. Phosphorus units per pound, magnesium units per pound. So now I've got to say, here's my cost per pound of these things to make a two ounce serving. So I've got A, here's my protein units, it's got to be greater than three. So I want to minimize my cost. Here's my riboflavin, phosphorus, magnesium. And guess what? When I add pounds of A plus pounds of B plus pounds of C, it has to be 0.125, which is two ounces, uh, there's 16 ounces in a pound. So if I divide one by 16, I get 1.25, and all my things have to be greater than zero. And what do I get? I get 0 0.025 pounds of grain A, um, 0 0.05 pounds of grain B, and 0 0.05 pounds of grain C. And the cost is gonna be five cents, 5.1 cents. And I'll find out binding constraint uh, a little bit of surplus here, binding constraint, binding constraint, binding constraint. This, by definition, is an equal constraint. It has to be binding. So you can look at ingredient mix and blending problems. So this 
oil company produces two grades of cut rate gasoline for industry. A regular and economy are created by blending two different types of crude oil. And a crude oil a differs in cost and its contents of a crucial ingredient, which uh, I don't know. I don't know what the ingredient is, but here's the two types of oil. Percent of ingredient A, percent of ingredient B, and cost per barrel. So you see the second one costs more but it has more of ingredient A, less of ingredient B. So we don't know what mix we want in the final gasoline. So X1 barrels of crude to be blended to produce a refined regular. Remember, we have two kinds. We're producing regular and economy, regular and economy, and we have two different things, two, two different inputs. So I have my, there's two dimensions to this. I have two raw materials and I'm blending them together to make two finished products. So two times two is going to give me four variables. And the objective function looks like this. 30x1 plus 30x2 since this is still the cost of the barrel of the first crude and here's the second one which costs more and that's my objective function. Now, at least 45% of each barrel of regular must be ingredient A. X1 plus X3 has to be the total amount of crude blended to produce the refined regular gasoline. So thus, 0.45 X1 plus X3 is the amount of ingredient A required. But 0.35x1 plus 0.6x3 is the amount of ingredient A in refined regular gas, so that you got you've got to get this inequality. Do the math to get all the stuff on the right left, left hand side, and you get minus 0.1x1 plus 0.15x3 ingredient A in the regular constraint. And you've got to repeat these calculations over again. So you have X1 plus X3, you have to have 25,000 gallons at least of that, or barrels, and 32,000 barrels of that, and then you have these constraints for each kind, and you go ahead and solve it. And it's going to cost you uh, $1.8 $1 million, and you find out that these two constraints are binding, and in fact, all the constraints are binding. There's not a lot of wiggle room in this problem either. Uh, shipping problem. Uh, number of origins and you're shipping things to the number of destinations and you're trying to minimize either total shipping costs or distances. So you have this bicycle company. Uh, the requirements for the next year are 10,000 bikes in New York, 8,000 bikes in Chicago, uh, 15,000 bicycles in uh, Los Angeles. The factory capacities are 20,000 and 15,000 at their New Orleans, New Orleans and uh, Omaha factories. The cost of shipping the bikes from New Orleans to New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Omaha to New York, Chicago, and are outlined there and we're trying to minimize costs so you have two sources three destinations you know you're going to have six variables bicycles produced in location one or two shipped to destinations one two or three so the company wants to develop a shipping schedule that will minimize its annual cost so here you got if you draw a schematic like this you see that you have one two three four, five, six different schemas. And they've got the demand, they've got the costs. You've basically summarized the whole problem here. So uh, here's X11, New Orleans to New York, New Orleans to Chicago, New Orleans to Los Angeles. So all the ones with one are produced in New, New Orleans. Uh, the first number being two here. Uh, they're produced in Omaha and are shipped the shipping location is second, so one means New York, two means uh, Chicago, and three means Los Angeles. 
course, is simplified because you can probably ship them to a lot more different places. But let's assume that's their distribution centers. So here's my total shipping costs. Subject to the amount of bikes I need in New York is 10,000. The amount of bikes I need in Chicago is 8. Notice that they're equal to. Didn't say less than or equal to. you got to actually meet that demand in this case. And then I want to, I can only make, I cannot make more than 20,000 bikes in New Orleans. I can't make more than 15,000. So all variables are greater than zero. And here's what that looks like. It's going to cost me $96,000 to move these bikes around. And again, a lot of zeros and ones. The transportation problems almost exclusively have zeros and ones as the constraint coefficients. Okay. There's the answer, and you'll see that New Orleans makes uh, all the bikes for New York and part of the bikes for Los Angeles. Omaha makes all the bikes for Chicago and the other remaining value of the bikes for Los Angeles Distribution Center. And that's it. That's all we got. And that's how we uh, uh, look at these more advanced problems. Uh, there's some tips and tricks you've got to look at. Remember that percentage thing. Remember that when to use zero constraints and you're going to have some mixture of less than, equal to, greater than or equal to, and zero constraints. And if you have an in-between, like, you know, the volume of this has to be between 10 and 20. That can't be one constraint. It has to be two. It has to be, it has to be greater than 10 and it has to be less than 20. So you have to break that into two constraints. If you have a percentage constraint, you've got to get all the variables on the left-hand side and do the math. So do that carefully, and good luck. And this wraps up the presentations for this course. Thank you so much for your attention.